Um, actually, the second question. I'll ask the first question later. Second question. First question is too technical. Uh, second question: Why is the why is it recommended to recite the ziyarat of Imam Ali in ev in evening and the day of Ma'at? Similarly, why do we have ziyarat of Imam Hussein on different religious occasions? Um, if you please uh, answer that question. And bear in mind, we have 15 or 16 more questions, so it has to be very Inshallah, Sheikh Mustafa is going to answer that question. Yes, I was thinking, uh, we, see, we uh, see generally in computations, if we answer something, we get Christ. So, if we answer, <laughs> then <laughs> are we going to get some prizes or no? <laughs> It's actually a very uh, good reflection and good question. And normally when, it's, when you say it's a good question, you don't know the answer, do you? No? A, that's a good question. That means you don't know. Uh, so, but anyhow, uh, in terms of what, what the suggestion here is regarding, uh, first I'll go back to the ziyarah of Imam Hussein salam because it's recommended in every occasion. Pretty much every occasion that we have, we have the recommendation of ziyarah of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Why? Because without him, there would not be any occasion. Without him, we would not be remembering any of these occasions. There would not be a Eid. There would not be, a, there would not be anything of Islam. They would have made Islam into a commercialized religion, just like other groups have done. And there would not be much of the spirit of Islam without Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Therefore, in every occasion, we have the ziyarah of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. In terms of the ziyarah of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, specific, specifically uh, uh, in connection with, uh, to the Mabahat, it is because, it's a suggestion again, Imam Ali alayhi salam is nafsu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Mabahat is to take us to, to completion the completion of the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam happened with the wilaya of Imam Ali alayhi salam. When the wilaya was declared, is when Allah subhanahu wa taala declared, "Al yoma akmaltu lakum dinakum wa akmaltu alaykum naamati." It was not completed without the wilaya of Imam Ali alayhi salam. He is the partner. Some people don't pay attention to this part of the hadith. There's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, famous, Antamini bimanzila hadith al-manzila. Manzilati Haruna min Musa. What was Harun to Musa? Just like he was his khalifa? No. Harun was the partner. Ash'ushdud bihi azri wa ashrikhu fi amri. Harun was the partner of Risala of Musa. Just like Imam Ali السلام, was the partner of Risala of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, so there's anything to add? Just I want to add one uh, small point. When it comes to the uh, reasons of any commandments, uh, either wajib or haram or mustahab, generally, uh, whatever is part of our belief, we need to be explained um, through logic and dalil. But when it comes to our uh, activities and actions, amal, wajib or mustahab or haram, we are totally dependent on wahi, Quran, or hadith sayings of Rasulullah and Rasul. It doesn't mean we should not think about the reasons. Yes, we have right and we should think about the reasons and the benefits of any um, uh, rulings of Islam. But what we get as, in, uh, as, a, as a part of information that is called Juzbul Illa. That is a partial reason, like uh, Sayyid uh, Sheikh mentioned one or two points about uh, the reason behind uh, the um, uh, uh, Ziyarah of Amir Muin in the day of Mamas or the Ziyarah of Amir Muin every day. But there can be, could be tens of more reasons for that and more benefits. So it's good to uh, seek more and more knowledge, but we must know that 
for our all rulings and regulations. Why we do something? Why Salat Maghrib is three rakat and Isha is four rakat? Why Hajj is just once a year? Because we are told to do like that. Salva Muhammad wa It's a good question. We have to have uh, lectures for all uh, teachings of Islam and all uh, aspects of our religion and in our practical life. And I would agree with the uh, person who has uh, this question. We have to uh, a good discussion about jihad because of misinformation and because of negative propaganda. Even right now, the term jihad itself looks uh, very sensitive. So, because of that, and there are many other issues uh, like um, same sex marriage. Many people they face different types of challenges practically in their life. And these types of questions and issues are not discussed. And I am not blaming anyone I'm, uh, uh, else, even. <coughs> I, as a student, and we, we have to think and find some ways to discuss in a proper way. Uh, jihad is not any uh, kind of thing to be shy to discuss about that. Jihad, jihad in, real, in its real concept and understanding is very noble and beautiful um, uh, aspect of Islam. but. Uh, there are a lot of uh, misinformations and misguidance, so we have to understand that concept and we have to even explain to others who have misinformation about jihad. Just a word, uh, just a sentence, a word about that. By the way, every Thursday night we've been having a discussion about jihad. But we've been having a discussion about al jihad al akbar, the greater jihad which is uh, taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tazkiyatun nafs, the purification of the self. And so I welcome Medina Mu'mina to start with that one before we get to the level of uh, al-jihad al-asghar, because one could not reach the level or the target and the goal of al-jihad al-asghar without al-jihad al-akbar, without the purification of the nafs, even if one was to go in a battlefield, they could end up going on the wrong path and being like the Khawarij or the Shaheed for the sake of the Houthis. Huh? The, uh, in, in that specific case, it was a donkey. Yeah? Yeah, so, uh, so we have to be careful to make sure we purify our nafs and do the al jihad al akbar before we uh, head for the other jihad. But inshallah, uh, that we talk about both of them. So, uh, the, the next question, what is the negative impact of not visiting the Imams for a very long time? And are we basically allowed not to visit them for worldly reasons? I start with that. So, technically it is not wajib to go for ziyara and ziyara to visit Imam. But uh, it is a, an act of love and Ziyarat has very important role in our practical life and uh, I don't want to go in depth of Rivayat, what are the you know, benefits and the, and the, uh, and the uh, positive effects of visiting uh, any Imam's shrine, but technically it is not wajib. Yes, we are told uh, if you don't visit, especially when it comes to Imam Hussain, and you will, your Imam will be considered as a naqis, it is not completed. It is a kind of a, a moral and spiritual advice, then any technical point to uh, consider if it is logic. 
Yes, Hajj is wajib once in a lifetime, and then also we have many, many, I would say hundreds of hadith recommendations about uh, the concept of ziyara, and then uh, in many riwayat, hadith, especially ziyara, is compared with Hajj. It doesn't mean that Hajj has less significance no hajj is an, an, an important uh, an important uh, uh, ruling and uh, principle of of islam but uh, we are told ziyarat is very essential part of our iman as i said it is technically not wajib don't delay it for worldly reason if you try if you make an, inten an, an intention to visit uh, for, for Ziyara, inshallah then Allah will make a ways to visit and then it has worldly benefits. It will increase your sustenance, your rest, and you will feel relax relaxation in your practical life. Uh, may it be related to your job, your family issues, or any other reasons. So it is highly recommended in Tata. Just a note about this uh, ziyara versus uh, hajj, for instance. Uh, hajj is wajib. Once in a lifetime, you have to go to hajj. We have no uh, obligation in that sense. It is like salat that is wajib versus salatul layl. Salat that is wajib, you have to pray your salat, daily salat. But if you want to get to the highest levels, you have to do salatul layl. Without Salat al you will not get to the highest levels. And so, Ziyara is not wajib, it's mustahab. But it is the type that takes us to the highest levels. That's why the Imams, when, when they compared it to Hajj, they said, Alfa Alfa Hajj, Hajj. You know, a thousand, thousand Hajj. Why? Because wajib is there. But this recommendation is what takes you to the highest levels. ومن الليل فتهجد به نافلة لك عسى أن يبعثك ربك مقاما محمودا. The highest مقام that Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم achieved was related to صلاة الليل تهجد. And the highest مقامات are related to زيارة of Imam Hussein عليه السلام. What can we Please give us proof of the from Quran. The, the person wants the proof from Quran that the Sunnah is the best of creation. So obviously, the highest level of uh, uh, insan is one who connects to God and is able to invite people to God. If the greatest blessing of God upon mankind is guidance, if we recognize that, since it is, it is, but if we recognize that, if we recognize that the greatest blessing upon us is guidance, the greatest individuals are those who guide us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the Almighty God. These are the greatest individuals. And amongst them, the greatest is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the Quran, the ayah that says, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the first who took the mithaq. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ I believe in Surah Al-Shura. مِثَاقَهُ وَمِنْكَ وَمَنْ نُوحٍ وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى So he became the first. Although chronologically speaking, in terms of the history of Insan, he was not the first, but in terms of the Mitha, giving the covenant to God, he was the first who gave that in the Holy Quran. And so from that, our scholars deduce that he is, I mean, besides the ahadith, the numerous ahadith, uh, and besides the numerous ayat describing him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be of the highest level of khuluq, for example, but also that ayah begins with him when it should have, if it was not, uh, if it was not for a priority, the order should have started with Nuh and then Ibrahim and then Musa and Isa and then him. But it started with him. Wa minka wa and the rest of the Nabi.
Mashallah, questions are so good. So every uh, single question is a complete lecture. Excellent. And uh, there are number of ayah just to mention, like uh, Sheikh what uh, he mentioned, and I would like to add one more important. And the mafhum, the meaning is all messengers, they are, uh, um, they will be uh, as a witness in the day of judgment before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Rasulullah will be as a witness for all other messengers. So the relation between Anbiya and Rasulullah and Anbiya and their nations, the, the relation is same. What nispa and connection and uh, has a nation with his messenger, all messengers together have the same nispa and distance when it comes to Rasulullah. And then also, Rasulullah. This is just for Rasulullah. This is the biggest imtina in favor of uh, uh, Rasulullah. Rahmatan uh, lil'alameen uh, means he is a mercy for Anbiya themselves. So we can uh, mention any other uh, verses from Quran and Najib. And this is not controversial issue among all Muslims. to seek advice and consent, or charity should never be discussed even with the spouse. There is no need. We have in Quran, uh, when it comes to charity, uh, give it in a, in a uh, hidden way or in an open way. So I'll make it just general, not the spouse or family members, for example. So uh, there are many tafasil, one of uh, those interpretations is when you give as a charity to any cause and then you think it will encourage other people, then you say it loudly, involve your family members, uh, take their suggestions, everything, and to encourage everybody to teach them. You want to give sadaqa, give it to your uh, to hands of your um, child, your son, daughter, to teach them how to do charity and to teach them the importance of charity. But when it comes to personal favors, for example, you know someone, he is deserving and then if you share uh, your charity or the amount with your family members or friends, it will, not, it, is, uh, it will not be good for him or her who is getting that benefit and the beneficiary, then I think that time it will be, it will be better to just don't share with anyone and keep it with you. Allah will reward you more that time. And then the basic principle is don't uh, say something and don't destroy your charity by um, saying something about the beneficiary which hurts him. To show that I have uh, to destroy or to hurt his reputation uh, or his um, honor in the society. Yeah. Hadith. There is a hadith that says, uh, so say you put it beautifully, if you're trying to encourage others, go, say it openly, if, you're, if, you're, if there's no issue of encouraging, and especially if you want to keep someone's privacy uh, protected, then don't share anything about it. There's a hadith that says when you give the charity, if you share it the first time, if you give a secret charity, which is a very special type of charity, the first time you share it, it goes from secret to open. It goes from sir to alania. And the second time you share it, it goes from alania to riyad. So the more you talk about a charitable thing, unless you are doing it with the intention, and it's very uh, tricky, huh? uh, very um, uh, basically uh, slippery slope, is that what they say? Uh, to to uh, go on it because you try and justify it to yourself. I'm saying it only because I want to encourage, but then nafs comes in and you're boasting, so be very careful. Uh, as long as you can, keep it secret, it's uh, best. And when it's about encouraging, 
then give it openly. If it's wajib, they say give it openly. If it's mustahab, better keep a secret. But there are I think that suffices. Thank you, Jazakallah. We have two minutes left, but we have uh, many, many questions left, too. So I'm going to go quickly, and if you can also make your answer as well, that would be great. Thank you. 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 As per my memory, uh, we, uh, we learn and we uh, read in the history. Amir was always with Rasulullah after uh, even before the regulation. And this is one of the interesting points. I have to make it short that uh, if any child, small, uh, they, um, a small child is there when they take. Uh, 35 years old person, then it will be a matter of boring. So this connection, this relation was not a, a worldly relation. I mean, when he was there, whenever Rasulullah uh, generally uh, was in the cave of Hera, I mean, when he was there, so we are told that Rasulullah generally, I mean, when he was there, then uh, Ayat and Wahid was revealed. I don't have some specific reference in the uh, more, more than that to say, if she has something you can add. There is a, a reference from Amir al salam himself yes. uh, that he was there hearing. So he heard the revelation. Uh, and yes, is it possible? Of course it is possible. Uh, again, why is it, uh, I want to say this, why is it that what we accept for Ibrahim and Ali Ibrahim, we don't accept for Muhammad and Ali Muhammad? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And Ali Ibrahim were prophets. The difference between Ali Ibrahim and Ali Muhammad, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, is that in this case, they're just not prophets, but they're everything else and more. Seven year old question. This is from a seven year old. Uh, does it hurt when we die? Sorry? No. Does it hurt when we die? Does it hurt when you die? Die. Uh, if you're a mu'min, no. Is it painful when so, you die? Uh, uh, the uh, the question is uh, do you feel the pain? Yes. So, uh, we, we, uh, the, 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 uh, when it comes to like uh, physical way of, material way of thinking, uh, yes, generally what science says and what is uh, apparently uh, noticed when someone is dying, he feels something. But at the same time, in the last moment of uh, Nazar, uh, all movement, they get good news of their success. And then we have Hadith, uh, when uh, uh, Malakul Maut, angel of death, comes to a movement, he uh, gets um, uh, scary, he uh, gets scared, and then he says, don't worry, don't get scared, I am uh, merciful and shafiq, then you are parents for you, just smell this beautiful flower, and then he feels very good, and then he goes to uh, join with all other mu'mineen and their awliya Allah and Aima based on his spiritual status. All people are not in the same uh, status. And then some people they have very painful uh, last times because of some hukukun nas to hurt other people. So it, it is, a, I think, again, this issue is uh, uh, very huge. And if we want to go in different branches of this question, we have to talk much more. There are people who suggest that uh, we have to um, join, the, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. So we have to make Islamic centers into more like fun centers and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't necessarily 
fully agree or fully disagree. Uh, it's good to listen to what people uh, have to say and what they like so that you can accommodate as much as you can. And when it comes to certain age groups, it's good to, especially the youth, we need to make sure that we are reaching them and we are keeping them entertained. And not just by them having games outside, but doing things for their sake, programs that are more geared towards them. So it's important to do all that. Uh, at the same time, uh, it, it is a sad reality that we're living in, in uh, today's world. And this comes to parents. Centers can do as much as they can do, and they can do so much. That's the reality. Parents are the ones who have to make an effort and realize that they're not just living for dunya. There is an akhirah. And they're, as soon as they come closer to uh, you know, the time of death, as we were speaking in the previous question, they will realize that. And so it is parents who need to work hard to bring, bring their families and children, I mean their children, essentially, and uh, make these places thrive. Um, I mentioned to Mu'minina Mu'minat, if we have 20, 30 kids outside now, we should have at least 10 of the parents volunteering to teach them, to do something for them, not just focus on uh, certain aspects of programs, but also look at what we can. It is an educational center, therefore focus on what we can give those children because it is, it is most significant food that would keep them coming is intellectual food, believe me. Intellectual food is what would keep them coming, not necessarily other types of uh, entertainment and so on. We cannot compete with their, uh, you know, school activities and after school activities in terms of fun. We cannot compete with uh, teenagers having fun out there together. What we can give them is intellectual food to their level that they would enjoy and that would keep them coming, inshallah. Any thoughts on it? No? Okay, next question. Uh, why was the Niyah for Salah created if Allah already knows what they will be praying? I think you, you must know what are you doing. Niyah is not for Allah, Niyah is for you. Why are you going? Niyah has always two parts. I'll make it just uh, very short. Niyah always is two parts. The first part is different for every action, but the second part is common. What is the first part? You have to determine, you have to fix what are you doing. If it is Maghrib Salat or Isha Salat, are you doing Wuzu or you are just your washing? So you fix your action, your Amal, what are you doing? What are you doing? You have to make it proper. This is Salat Maghrib Jama'ah or this is Salat Isha, Ada, Qada, something. And the second part is always common. What is that? Parbatan ila Allah. Why are you uh, doing wudu? Just to wash your face? No. To seek Allah's closeness. Or to complete your duty. To uh, complete the commandments of Allah. To, so, Parbatan uh, is always common. And the first part is to determine, to fix what are you doing? So niyat is not uh, just for Allah, niyat is for ourselves. We have to do Just to clarify, if they refer in just a clarification, if they're referring to the verbal niyyah, it is not necessary. So niyyah is in the mind. In the, if you know in your mind what you're doing, you don't have to say it. If saying it helps you make sure you, you don't get confused, it's good, it's okay. But you don't have to say it. Niyya is in the mind. If that's what they're referring to, they don't have to say it. God knows it. The question is, why was the Niyya for Salah created? If Allah already knows what we do. But, but I think that part said already answered. Because it, it's, it, it, it is for you to know. God knows, but I need to know what I'm doing. That's it. Why is it, what is the importance of flag in Islam? For example, we see that in the Islamic wars, the flag were given to the strongest and most qualified person in the army. Can we use any flag and hang it on the wall or in our homes, even if it is the flag of misguided people or the flags of arrogance and oppressive countries? I think we can uh, have some general understanding uh, keeping flag is not 
the, any obligatory action, but it has very significant role. It is it is a symbol of like um, uh, what flags are related to uh, Imam Hussein's um, um, stories and Abu Fazl Abbas flag was there in uh, Battle of Khaybar for everything. So it has its uh, significance and it is responded, but there is no any kind of obligation. So what kind of Flags we must not keep on service, on service general. If it is kind of, it leads towards any misguidance, haram, or it is a uh, kind of means to support any oppressor and zalim. If it is there, if you, uh, if you ask even Maraje, they answer like that. So if it leads your um, if uh, your act leads you towards any haram or secondary haram, then you have to avoid that kind of act. And then we can extend the same concept. If you uh, you love some sports person, for example, some soccer celebrity, so you are allowed to follow him in that game. What is his techniques and tricks? How to play? But if you want to make your room, your life full of his uh, pics and uh, photos and all of this, then it influences you and your life. So we are told, like, do ziyarat of Muhammad Hussain, offer salat, recitation of Quran, have stories of Ambiya and Aima, because all of these signs and symbols have its own influence on, in our practical life. So uh, the next question is, does the intercession of the Imams include sinners? More than that, does their intercession include oppressors of the Ahlubayt like Shem Ranazi? So uh, sinners are the ones who need intercession to stop it. And if they don't receive it, I don't know who, who would. But they have to have certain conditions. So there are conditions for it. Um, they have to want that. They have to expose or uh, turn towards that. It's just like the hidayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's there for everyone. But do we accept it? Or do we not accept it or reject it, God forbid? So intercession of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt or the Prophets are there, available. Do we accept it? Do we turn towards it? Do we seek it? So if one is a sinner, but they come to the uh, Prophet وسلم, and seek his intercession and seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they would be included. And this is literally what we read in the ziyarah of Rasulullah from the Holy Quran, where we say, if they, uh, if these people, when they are sinning, when they are doing the wrong thing, they come to you, Ya Rasulullah, and they seek forgiveness from God, and you seek forgiveness for them, on top of them seeking it, then they will find God of returning, of merciful. So it is there for the sinner if they turn towards the ma'asum, seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their conditions for it. Would it include those? I don't think those sinners at that level would have the opportunity of turning to Ahlul Bayt and turning to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, turning to God for seeking forgiveness. Did, uh, why did Allah send 12,000 prophets but only 12 imams? Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. It's not 12,000, by the way. Wa alaykum as-salam, because he said salam, so he had to answer this one's prayer to the salam. Uh, I think it based, I, I will give just very a simple and general answer. It based on the need. Uh, nations, people, they needed messengers in all times, so it took time and then gradually they came. Uh, 125,000, 24,000 is the famous uh, number. 
it can be slightly um, more or less. And then once Islam was completed and the revelation was completed, Khabar, uh, the, the major, the main task of Nabi is to deliver messages from there. When all messages were completed, there was no need for prophethood. So prophethood was completed by the Surah, but the leadership and guidance and the spiritual leadership appointed by Allah is needed until the day of judgment. So Levin and Imam, they were um, there and they tried their best, they guided the people. Uh, and when all of them, they were martyred, martyred and killed, a twelfth Imam is in Raiva, so he is there and according to our faith, based on the law and logics, uh, this earth and world cannot be uh, stay and it cannot be survived without uh, any representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the numbers, what is the reason? We have to go in depth and then right now I think I don't have that much thing to share. Alhamdulillah, we have from this beautiful family only one left. Inshallah, Allah will make us see him. Uh, why is there a different number of black ass units in each salat? I think that's from an 11 year old person. That was answered already, I think. Sayyid mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, yes, uh, there must be a reason and there are reasons for uh, all numbers and nothing is there randomly uh, made as a part of religion and we have some explanations about the numbers of um, uh, rakat or all other things but as I said before, when it comes to the details of our uh, obligations and duties we are totally dependent on God and Hadith, on Quran and sayings of Rasulullah and the writings of Islam. Jazakallah, the time now, Sunday at 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30, 11.30,